Over Sea, Under Stone Written by Susan Cooper Chapter 1 Where is he? Barney hopped from one foot to the other as he clambered down from the train, peering in vain through the white-faced crowds floating eagerly to the St. Austell ter- ticket barrier. Oh, I can't see him! Is he there? Of course he's there, Simon said, struggling to clutch the long canvas bundle of his father's fishing rods. He said he'd meet us with the car. Behind them, the big diesel locomotive hooted like a giant owl, and the train began to move out. Stay where you are a minute, father said from a barricade of suitcases. Mary won't vanish. Let people get clear. Jane sniffed ecstatically. I can smell the sea! We're miles from the sea, Simon said loftily. I don't care. I can smell it. Treswick's five miles from St. Austell, Great Uncle Mary said. Oh, where is he? Barney still jigged impatiently on the dusty gray platform, glaring at the disappearing backs that masked his view. Then suddenly he stood still, gazing downwards. Hey! Look! They looked. He was staring at a large black suitcase among the forest of shuffling legs. What's so marvelous about that? Then they saw that the suitcase had two brown pricked ears and a long waving brown tail. Its owner picked it up and moved away, and the dog which had been behind it was left standing there alone, looking up and down the platform. He was a long, rangy, lean dog, and where the sunlight shafted down on his coat, it gleamed dark red. Barney whistled and held out his hand. "'Darling, no,' said his mother plaintively, clutching at the bunch of paintbrushes that sprouted from her pocket like a tuft of celery. But even before Barney whistled, the dog had begun trotting in their direction, swift and determined as if he were recognizing old friends. He loped around them in a circle, raising his long red muzzle to each in turn, then stopped beside Jane and licked her hand. "'Isn't he gorgeous?' Jane crouched beside him and ruffled the long silky fur of his neck. "'Darling, be careful,' Mother said. i will get left behind. He must belong to someone over there.' "'I wish he belonged to us.' "'So does he,' Bonnie said. "'Look!' He scratched the red head, and the dog gave a throaty half-bark of pleasure. No, father said. The crowds were thinning now, and through the barrier they could see clear blue sky out over the station yard. His name's on his collar, Jane said, still down beside the dog's neck. She r- fumbled with the silver tub on the s- heavy strap. It says Rufus, and something else. Triswick, hey, he comes from the village. But as she looked up, suddenly the others were not there. She jumped to her feet and ran after them into the sunshine, seeing in an instant what they had seen, the towering, familiar figure of Great Uncle Mary, out in the yard, waiting for them. They clustered round him, chattering like squirrels around the base of a tree. "'Oh, there you are,' he said casually, looking down at them from beneath his bristling white eyebrows with a slight smile. "'Cornwall's wonderful,' Barney said, bubbling. "'You haven't seen it yet,' said Great Uncle Mary. "'How are you, Ellen, my dear?' He bent down and aimed a brief peck at Mother's cheek. He treated her always as though he had forgotten that she had grown up. Although he was not her real uncle, but only a friend of her father, he had been close to the family for so many years that it never occurred to them to wonder where he had come from in the first place. Nobody knew very much about Great Uncle Mary, and nobody quite ever dared to ask. He did not look in the least like his name. He was tall and straight, with a lot of very thick, wild white hair. In his grim brown face, the nose curved fiercely, like a bent bow, and the eyes were deep-set and dark. How old he was, nobody knew. "'Old as the hills,' father said, and they felt deep down that this is probably right. There was something about Great Uncle Mary that was like the hills, or the sea or the sky. Something ancient, but without age or end. Some, always, wherever he was, unusual things seemed to happen. He would often disappear for a long time, and then suddenly come through the Drew's front door as if he had never been away, announcing that he had found a lost valley in South America, a Roman fortress in France, or a burned Viking ship buried on the English coast. The newspapers would publish enthusiastic stories of what he had done, but by the time the reporters came knocking at the door, Great Uncle Mary would be gone, back to the dusty piece of the university where he taught. They would wake up one morning, go to call him for breakfast, and find that he was not there, and then they would hear no more of him until the next time, perhaps months later, that he appeared at the door. It hardly seemed possible that this summer, in the house he had rented for them in Treswick, they would be with him in one place for four whole weeks. The sunlight glinting on his white hair, Great Uncle Mary scooped up their two biggest suitcases, one under each arm, 
and strode across the yard to a car. "'What do you think of that?' he demanded proudly. Following, they looked. It was a vast, battered estate car, with rusting mudguards and appealing paint, and mud kicked on the hubs of the wheels. A wisp of steam curled up in the radiator. "'Smashing!' said Simon. "'Hmm,' Mother said. "'Well, Mary,' Father said cheerfully, "'I hope you're well insured.' Great Uncle Mary snorted. "'Nonsense! Splendid vehicle! I hired her from a farmer. She'll hold us all anyway. In you get!' Jane glanced regretfully back at the station entrance as she clambered in after the rest. The long-haired dog was standing on the pavement watching them, long pink tongue dangling over white teeth. Great Uncle Mary called, "'Come on, Rufus!' "'Oh!' Barney said in delight as a fur flurry of long legs and wet muzzle shot through the door and knocked him sideways. "'Does he belong to you?' "'Heaven forbid!' Great Uncle Mary said. "'But I suppose he'll belong to you three for the next month. The captain couldn't take him abroad, so Rufus goes to the Grey House.' He folded himself into the driving seat. "'The Grey House?' Simon said. "'Is that what it's called? Why?' "'Wait and see.' The engine gave a hiccup and a roar, and then they were away. Through the seats, streets, and out of the town they thundered in the lurching car, until hedges took the place of houses, thick wild hedges growing high and green as the road wound uphill, and behind them the grass sweeping up to the sky. And against the sky they saw nothing but lonely trees, stunted and bowed by the wind that blew from the sea, and yellow-gray outcrops of rock. "'There you are, then,' Grand Uncle Mary shouted over the noise. He turned his head and waved one arm away from the steering wheel so that father moaned softly and hid his eyes. Now you're in Cornwall, the real Cornwall. Logress is before you. The clatter was too loud for anyone to call back. What's he mean, Logress? demanded Jane. Simon shook his head, and the dog licked his ears. He means the land of the West, Barney said unexpectedly, pushing back the forelock of fair hair that always tumbled over his eyes. It's the old name for Cornwall, King Arthur's name. Simon groaned. I might have known. Ever since he had learned to read, Barney's greatest heroes had been King Arthur and his knights. In his dreams he fought imaginary battles as a member of the round table, rescuing fair ladies and slaying false knights. He had been longing to come to the West Country. It gave him a strange feeling that he would be in some way coming home. He said resentfully, You wait. Great Uncle Mary knows. And then, after what seemed a long time, the hills gave way to the long blue line of the sea, and the village was before them. Treswick seemed to be sleeping beneath its grey, slate-tiled roofs along the narrow winding streets behind, down the hill. Silent behind their lace-curtained windows, the little square houses let the roar of the car bounce back from their whitewashed walls. Then Great Uncle Mary swung the wheel round, and suddenly they were driving along the edge of the harbour, past water rippling and flashing golden in the afternoon sun. Sailing dinghies bopped at their moorings along the key, along the quay and a whole row of the Cornish fisher boats that they had seen only in pictures painted by their mother years before. Stocky workmanlike boats, each with a stubby mast and a small square engine house in the stern. Nets hung dark over the harbor walls, and a few fishermen, hefty, brown-faced men in long boots that reached their thighs, glanced up idly as the car passed. Two or three grinned at Uncle Mary and waved. "'Do they know you?' Simon asked curiously. But great Uncle Mary— who could become very deaf when he chose not to answer a question, only roared on along the road that curved up to the hill, high over the other side of the harbor, and suddenly stopped. "'Here we are,' he said. In the abrupt silence, their ears still numb from the thundering engine, they all turned from the seat to look at the other side of the road. They saw on a terrace of houses sloping sideways up the steep hill, and in the middle of them, rising up like a tower, one tall, narrow house with three rows of windows and a gabled roof. A somber house, painted dark gray, with the door and window frame shining white. The roof was slate-titled, a high blue-gray arch facing out across the harbor to the sea. The gray house, Great Uncle Mary said. They could smell strangeness in the breeze that blew faintly on their faces down the hill. A beckoning smell of salt and seaweed and excitement. As they unloaded suitcases from the car, with Rufus starting in, Excited frenzy through everyone's legs. Simon suddenly clutched Jane by the arm. Gosh, look! He was pointing out to sea, behind, beyond the harbor mouth. Along his pointed finger, Jane saw the tall, graceful triangle of a yacht under full sail, moving lazily in towards Treswick. Pretty, she said, with only mild enthusiasm. She did not share Simon's passion for boats. 
Oh, she's a beauty. I wonder who she is. Simon stood watching, entranced. The yacht crept nearer, her sails beginning to flap, and then the tall white mainsail crumpled and dropped. They heard the rattle of rigging, very faint across the water, and the throaty cough of an engine. Mother says he can go down and look at the harbour before supper, Barney said behind them. Coming? Of course. Will great Uncle Mary come? He's going to put the car away. They set off down the road leading to the quay, beside a low gray wall with tufts of grass and pink valerian growing beneath the stones. In a few paces, Jane found she had forgotten her handkerchief, and she ran back to retrieve it from the car. Scrabbling on the floor by the back seat, she glanced up and stared for a moment through the windscreen, surprised. Great Uncle Mary, coming back toward the car from the gray house, had suddenly stopped in his tracks at the middle of the road. He was gazing down at the sea, and she realized that he had caught sight of the yacht. What startled her was the expression on his face. Standing there like a craggy, towering statue, he was frowning, fierce and intense, almost as if he were looking and listening with senses other than his eyes and ears. He could never look frightened, she thought, but this was the nearest thing to it that she had ever seen. Cautious, startled, alarmed. What was the matter with him? Was there something strange about the yacht? Then he turned and went quickly back into the house, and Jane emerged thoughtfully from the car to follow the boys down the hill. The harbor was almost deserted. The sun was hot on their faces, and they felt the warmth of the stone quayside strike at their feet through their sandal soles. In the center, in front of a tall wooden warehouse doors, the quay jutted out square into the water, and a great heap of empty boxes towered over their heads. Three seagulls walked tolerantly to the edge, out of their way. Before them, a small forest of spars and ropes swayed. The tide was only half high, and the decks of the moored boats were down below the quayside, out of sight. Hey, Simon said, pointing through the harbor entrance. That yacht's coming. Look, isn't she marvelous? The slim, white boat sat at anchor beyond the harbor wall, protected from the open seat by the headland on which the gray house stood. Jane said, Do you think there's anything odd about her? Odd? Why should there be? Oh, I don't know. Perhaps she belongs to the harbor master, Barney said. Places like this don't have harbor masters, you little fat head. Only ports like father went to in the navy. Oh yes, they do, clever sticks. There's a big, there's a little black door on the corner over there, marked harbor master's office. Barney hopped triumphantly up and down, and a frightened seagull away. It ran a few steps and then flew off, flapping low over the water and bleeding into the distance. Oh well, Simon said amiably, shoving his hands in his pockets and standing on, with his legs apart, rocking on his heels, and his captain on the bridge stance. One up. Still. That boat must belong to someone pretty rich. You could cross the channel in her, or even the Atlantic. Ugh, said Jane. She swam as well as anybody, but she was the only member of the Drew family who disliked the open sea. Fancy crossing the Atlantic in a thing that size. Simon grinned wickedly. Smashing. S great big waves picking you up and bringing you down. Swoosh. Everything falling about, pots and pans upsetting in the galley, and then it going up and down, up and down. You'll make her sick, Barney said calmly. Rubbish. On dry land out here in the sun? Yes, you will. She looks a bit green already. Look. I don't. Oh, yes, you do. I can't see why you weren't ill in the train like you usually are. Just think of those waves in the Atlantic. And the mast swaying about. And nobody with an appetite for the breakfast except me. Oh, shut up. I'm not going to listen. And poor Jane turned and ran around the side of the mountain of fishy-smelling boxes, which had probably been having more effect on her imagination than the thought of the sea. "'Girls,' said Simon, cheerfully. There was suddenly an ear-splitting crash from the other side of the boxes, a scream, and a noise of metal jingling on concrete. Simon and Barney gazed horrified at one another for a moment, and rushed round to the other side. Jane was lying on the ground with a bicycle on top of her, its front wheel still spinning around. A tall, dark-haired boy lay sprawled across the quay not far away. A box of tins and packets of food had spilled from the bicycle carrier, and milk was trickling in a white puddle from a broken bottle splintered, glittering in the sun. The boy scrambled to his feet, glaring at Jane. He was all in navy blue, his trousers tucked into Wellington boots. He had a short, thick neck and strangely flat face, twisted now with ill temper. "'Look where you's going, Candy!' he snarled, the cornish accent made ugly by anger. "'Get out of my way!' He jerked the bicycle upright, taking no heed of Jane. The pedal caught her ankle, and she winced with pain. "'It wasn't my fault,' she said with some spirit. "'You came rushing up when, without looking where you were going.' 
Barney crossed to her in silence and helped her to her feet. The boy suddenly began picking up his spilled tins and slamming them back into the box. Jane picked one up to help, but as she reached it towards the box, the boy knocked her hand away, sending the tin spinning across the key. Leave him alone, he growled. Look here, Simon said indignantly. There's no need for that. Shut your mouth, the boy said shortly, without even looking up. Shut your own, Simon said belligerently. Oh, Simon, don't, Jane said unhappily. If he wants to be beastly, let him. Her leg was stinging viciously, and blood trickled down from a graze on her knee. Simon looked at her flushed face, hearing the strain in her voice. He bit his lip. The boy pushed his bicycle to lean against the pile of boxes, scowling at Barney as he jumped nervously out of the way. Then Rage suddenly snarled out of him again. Off the lot of ye! He snapped, and they had never heard the word he used. But the tone was unmistakable, and Simon went hot with embarrassment and resentment, and clutched his fish to his fist to lunge forward. But Jane clutched him back, and the boy moved quickly to the edge of the key and climbed over the edge, facing them, to the box of groceries in his arms. They heard a thumping, clattering noise, and looking over the edge, they saw him lurching about in a rowing dinghy. He untied his mooring rope from a ring in the wall and began edging out through the other boats into the open harbor, standing up with one oar thrust down over the stern. Moving hastily and angrily, he shouted the, he clattered the dinghy hard against one of the sides of the boats and took no notice. Soon he was out in open water, sculling rapidly, one-handed, and glaring back at them in sneering contempt. As he did so, they heard a clatter of feet moving rapidly over hollow wood from one side of the injured fishing boat. A small, wizened figure popped up suddenly from a hatch in the deck and waved its arms about in fury, shouting over the water towards the boy in a surprisingly deep voice. The boy deliberately turned his back, still sculling, and the dinghy disappeared outside the harbor entrance, round the jutting wall. The little man shook his fist, then turned towards the quay, leaping neatly from the deck of one boat to another, until he reached the ladder in the wall and climbed up by the children's feet. He wore the inevitably navy blue jersey and trousers, with long boots reaching up to his legs. "'Clumsy young limb, that Bill Hoover," he said crossly. "'Wait until I get in. That's all. Just wait.' Then he seemed to realize that the children were, not, were more than just part of the key. He grunted, flushing a quick glance at their tense faces and the blood on Jane's knee. "'Thought I heard voices from below,' he said more gently. "'You've been having trouble with him.' He jerked his head out to see. "'He knocked my sister over with his bike.' Simon said indignantly. It was my fault, really. I made her run into him, but he was beastly rude and he bashed Jane's hand away and... And then he went off before I could hit him, he ended lamely. The old fisherman smiled at him. Oh, well, don't take you no count of him. He's in my bad lot, that lad, evil-tempered as they come, and evil-minded with it. You keep away from him. We shall, Jane said with a feeling, rubbing her leg gingerly. The fisherman clicked his tongue. That's a nasty old cut you got, the my dear. You want to go and get her washed up? You're a holiday, I dare say. Was staying in the grey house, Simon said, up there on the hill. The fisherman glanced at him quickly, a flicker of interest passing over the impassive, brown-wrinkled face. Are you then? I wonder, maybe. Then he stopped short, strangely, as if he were quickly changing his mind about what he had been going to say. Simon, puzzled, waited for him to go on. But Barney, who had not been listening, turned round from where he was had been peering over the edge of the quay. Is that your boat out there? The fisherman looked at him, half taken aback and half amused, as if he would, as if he had looked at some small, unexpected animal that barked. That's, that's right, me handsome. The one I just come off of. Don't the other fishermen mind you jumping over the boats? The old man laughed a cheerful, rusty noise. I'd no other way to get ashore from there. Nobody minds you coming across the boat so long as you don't mark her. Are you going out fishing? Not for a while, my dear," said the fisherman amiably pulling a piece of dirty rag from his pocket and scrubbing at the oil marks on his hands. Uh, with some day we do, he can come back with the dawn. Barney beamed. I shall get up early and watch you come in. But ain't that one I've seen, said the fisherman with a twinkle. Now look, you run and take your little sister home and wash that leg. Don't know what scales and muck have got in, into it off here. He scuffed, he scuffed to the key with his glistening boot. Yes, come on, Jane, Simon said. He took one more look out at the quiet line of boats then put his, up his hand to peer into the sun. I say, that oak with the bicycle, he's going on board the yacht. Jane and Barney looked. Out beyond the far harbor wall, a dark shape was bobbing against the long white hole of the silent yacht. They could just see the boy climbing up the side, and two figures meeting him on the deck. Then all three disappeared, and the boat lay deserted again. 
Ah, oh, said the fisherman. So that's it. Young Bill were buying stores and petrol, that's all. Yesterday, enough for the Navy. But nobody couldn't get an out of him who they was for. Tied your boat, that in. Cruising, I suppose. Can't see what he made all the mystery about. He began to walk along the quay, a rolling small figure with the folded tops of his boots slapping his legs every step. Barney trotted beside him, talking earnestly, and rejoined the others at the corner as the old man, waving to them, turned off toward the village. "'His name's Mr. Penolo, and his boat's called the White Heather. He says they got a hundred stone of pilker last night, and that the, they're to get more tomorrow because it's going to rain.' "'One day you'll ask too many questions,' said Jane. "'Rain?' said, was said Simon, incredulously, looking at the blue sky. That, "'That's what you said. Rubbish.' He must be nuts. I bet he's right. Fishermen always know things, especially Cornish fishermen. You ask Great Uncle Mary. But Great Uncle Mary, when they sat down to their first supper in the Grey House, wasn't there. Only the parents and the beaming red cheeked village woman, Mrs. Pock, who was coming in every day to help with the cooking and cleaning. Great Uncle Mary had gone away. Well, he must have said something, Jane said. Father shrugged. Not really. He just muttered about having to go and look for something, and rode off in the car like a thunder out. "'But we have only just got here,' Simon said, hurt. "'Never mind,' Mother said comfortably. "'You know where he is. He'll be back in his own good time.' Barney gazed dreamily at the Cornish pasties Miss Pock had made for their supper. "'He's gone on a quest. He might take years and years. You can search and search on a quest, and in the end you may never get there at all.' "'Quest my foot,' Simon said irritably. He's just gone chasing after some stupid old tomb in a church or something. What couldn't he have told us? I expect he'll be back in the morning, Jane said. She looked out of the window across the low gray wall edging, uh, edging the road. The light was beginning to die, and as the sun sank behind their headland into the sea, it was turning into a dark gray green, and slow mist creeping into the harbor. Through the growing haze she saw a dim shape move, down on the water, and above it a brief flash of light, first a red pinprick in the gloom, and then a green and white points of light above both, and she sat up suddenly as she realized that what she could see was the mysterious white yacht moving out of Treswick Harbor as silently and strangely as it had come.